All right. <clears throat> well, we are a little bit late today, but not too bad. Um, all right. So we do have a homework assignment due next week on the 4th. So I just want to remind everybody to kind of start on the homework assignment. If you have any questions, you know, I still have office hours before the homework assignment is due, even on that day, you know, because I have your know, office hour right before class. So that should be somewhat convenient. The recorder is on, the video is good, the audio is good. So I think we are ready to get into the class. Yes? Huh? It is due on the 4th. On the 3rd. Okay, that's probably on the 3rd. <laughs> what day is on the 3rd? Sunday. Sunday? Uh, let's make it due on the 4th. I'll, I'll adjust it. Give me a second here. <clears throat> it's the relation homework. You're right. Okay, it said it's due on the 3rd. So I'm going to change the due date so it's due on the 4th. There we go. And we'll change the when it's going to disclose the answer also to the 4th. There we go. All right, there we go. Yeah, I don't understand why we have, you know, these really awkward ways of keeping track of dates. Like there are 12 months and they don't have the same number of days in each month. And then we divide each month into weeks and the weeks are, you know, they, they consistently have seven days in a week. So, and then each year has 365.25 days. That one I do understand, okay? <clears throat> but, you know, yeah, just getting back to your point is, you know, I cannot just add seven and figure out, you know, what is the date seven days from today because of the month uh, issue. <clears throat> Yes, humans tend to make all kinds of irrational decisions and stick with them. That's the problem. I'm starting to sound like uh, the guy in uh, Resident Alien. Okay, if you guys have not watched that show, it's interesting. <clears throat> all right, so let's get back to what I like to talk about. <clears throat> So last time I gave you guys a map. Okay, so let me start with uh, reconnecting with my tablet because I think that's going to be useful. So give me a second here. There we go. Yeah, this tablet has a useful feature, but at the same time, it's kind of painful, not because of the tablet, but because of the school, you know, how the school deals with the networking. The only way for me to project the screen on this tablet onto this main screen here is a Wi-Fi connection from this computer to my laptop computer. Most of the other you know, tablets would allow a USB connection, you know, but this one it only wants a Wi-Fi connection. <clears throat> but the school's Wi-Fi network does not allow me to have device to device or peer to peer connection. So I have to basically turn this laptop computer into its own access point to give me a secondary Wi Fi you know, network in order to get this to work, which is not convenient. So we got here and do a refresh and see if that works. Nope, it still doesn't want to do it. Give it one more time. Yep, oh, it works. Okay. <clears throat> so let me show the tablet. There we go. All right, so now I have to go back and load the notes for this class. Okay, this is ARC 440, and we are here all right so this is the roadmap that i gave you guys uh, from monday <clears throat> so what we have talked about so far is 
um, the general idea of what is propositional logic and what is a well-formed formula and how do we use the inference rules in order to derive, you know, um, in order to label expressions, okay? You know, because the whole idea is you have this entire infinite space of well-formed formulae and certain elements in this entire space are initially labeled as true. That is your iota. And then, okay, do you guys have any questions? Any questions for me? Nope. Okay. So, um, so the iota, the set of iota, gives you certain expressions that are known to be true to begin with. And then by using the transformation rules, or we call it inference rules, we can start to label some of the other ones to also to be true. So by applying these inference rules in the set zeta, we can label more and more of these elements in the entire well-formed formula space to be true. The question is, the one that you're interested in, the, the one statement that is the quote-unquote proposed theorem, can you label that one? That's really the question, okay? So the problem is similar, not exactly the same, but very similar to finding a needle in a haystack, except the haystack is infinitely large, and we don't even know whether the needle is in a haystack or not. So that becomes a problem. So instead of solving the problem in that particular way, which is how humans you know, typically would solve a problem when you're asked to prove a theorem, you don't encounter problems like you know, what we are dealing with here because in your typical class, in a math class, your professor would not ask you to prove a theorem that is not a theorem to begin with. That would be kind of tricky. And most people would probably complain about that professor to the dean. It's like, okay, we got this homework assignment. Our professor asked us to prove this statement as a theorem, except it really is not a, sta it's not a theorem, right? But when you're, sol when you're solving problems in general, that can happen, okay? You may have a statement that you're interested in, but it turns out not to be a theorem given you know, what is given to you. So what we are gonna do is to kind of solve that problem by first you know, changing the infinite well-formed formula space to something that is finite. So we have to start to talk about the you know, CNF or conjunctive normal form and then we will talk about how to convert from a normal Boolean expression into the conjunctive normal form. And then we'll talk about resolution and proof by contradiction. These are all the pieces that we need in order to um, deal with theorem proving uh, with, and turn it into something that we can actually do. All right, so that's kind of you know, where we are at in terms of the roadmap. We are just starting with CNF today, conjunctive normal form. <clears throat> so let me go back to the presentation here. And we will get to, well, there are several ways to proceed. The first one, I will skip this section for now um, about completeness and soundness. Um, Essentially, what for section 4.1 is saying is you have a system of logic, but you have to make sure that system of logic is complete, which means everything that a human can do, that automated system can do as well. That is completeness. Soundness means you know, kind of the opposite way. Anything that can be that is concluded by the automated system makes sense. Okay, that's what soundness, soundness is basically you know, saying. Okay. But we are not going to get into this particular portion, at least not for now. And instead, we will talk about resolution. Because resolution is the whole reason of why CNF is something that we want to get into. So let's go into resolution first. Okay. So I have a little bit of a derivation here. Um, these are based on Boolean algebra, which we are going to learn in just a little bit. <clears throat> So what we start off with here is an implication as a statement, as an expression. Um, we have phi or psi and not psi or rho implies phi or rho. Okay, so this entire thing is one single expression. 
So that is equivalent to the following, okay? This has to do with um, A implies B is the same thing as not A or B. Okay, let me ask this question. Have we learned that already in this class? A implies B is not A or B. We have, the class has introduced that already, okay? So if this is new to you, that means you might have missed certain material in the class, okay? It's in the lecture. It is also in the modules, the earlier modules. So that's one thing that you might need to review. And then from here to here is an application of De Morgan's Law. So De Morgan's Law, okay, let me switch to <clears throat> the tablet here because I'm introducing Boolean algebra derivations at the same time as he was working out the proof. Okay. All right, so we, let's talk about De Morgan's Law. I think I have talked about De Morgan's Law, maybe not in a very official manner, but let's go ahead and do that. So we have De Morgan's Law, or De Morgan's Laws, okay, because there are two components to it. So you can say there's a negation of you know, P and R, so the negation is on the outside, this is the same thing as not P or not Q. All right? <clears throat> That's the first part of De Morgan's Laws. This is one, and then there's another one, which is the negation of P or Q is the same thing as the negation of P and the negation of Q. All right, so I believe that we have talked about this already, okay, but I'm just, I just want to make sure that we talk about it again. I also believe that last time when we talked about this, I said you can prove this pretty easily. And the mechanism of proving this is truth table, very good, okay. So you basically just make a truth table. Um, you make a truth table for, you know, uh, that has four entries because P and Q are independent Boolean variables. So they have four, so there are four rows to the truth table. You have columns for P, P and Q, and then you have one column for the expression on the left hand side of the equality, and then you have another column for the expression on the right hand side of the equality. So you work out the actual value of these two expressions for every single row. If they turn out to be exactly the same for every single row in the truth table, then the two expressions are equivalent, okay? And this is why Boolean algebra is kind of cool and easy in a way, because these techniques of proving, they do not work in general algebra. But in Boolean algebra, because each variable can either be a true or a false, cannot be anything else, you can just exhaustively find out, okay, for all the possible values of the variables, what is the value of this expression? You can exhaust you know, all of those possibilities. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So now that we have talked about De Morgan's Law, we can now go back here, and we have the application of De Morgan's Law from this line to this line here. Because this is a negation of an and, then the result becomes the negation of one of the components, or the negation of the other component. Are we doing okay so far about the application of the Morgan's Law from line one to line two? No problems, okay? So from line two to line three, what did I do? Well, I think we just did uh, the Morgan's Law again because I applied the Morgan's Law to the negation of this or, it becomes an and, but then each component of the original or is negated. Same thing over here. So now we end up with the third line. After the third line, we have you know, the fourth line. So changing from phi to phi and one, changing from row to row and one, one is true by the way, okay? That has to do with identities because one or true is the identity of conjunction and then false, which is also zero, is the identity of disjunction. So those are similar to rules that you have already seen in normal algebra, just a little bit different in this case. So um, the identities, okay, so identities, 
anything and true is whatever the anything is, anything or false is that anything. Is that okay? Yes? Okay. So once again, if you are not convinced, okay, you look at this and go like, I'm not convinced of this e e equivalency, you can use a truth table, okay? And you know, then in a truth table, in this case, the truth table would only have two rows because we only have one independent variable. And as a result, you know, this is a quick one to prove. I would recommend people to prove your know, De Morgan's law just as an exercise, okay? Because as you do that exercise, you're doing two things at the same time. One, you are understanding you know, what De Morgan's law is about, okay? And the second one is you are getting more practice with the um, technique of using a truth table to look at the equivalency between two expressions. So you're basically exercising two things at the same time. All right, so getting back here, <clears throat> so by introducing you know, this one over here, I now can say that this one is now, you know, uh, it turns into psi or not psi. And then this one here is also turning into psi or not psi, okay? So this is also in a sense, you know, a, a certain types of identity. So basically I'm saying, you know, P without knowing what P really is, um, okay, P or not P, is guaranteed to be a one. And then if you say and, then it's guaranteed to be a false. Are we doing okay with these? Does it make sense to you intuitively? Okay, if it makes sense to you intuitively, that's great. If it does not, use a truth table, okay? So if you use a truth table, you can prove using a truth table that P or not P is always going to be true, regardless of what the value of P is. And then for the same similar reason, P and not P is also guaranteed to be, to be false. I'll be doing okay so far with these. So these are the basic rules of algebra or Boolean algebra. Um, these two are, they have <clears throat> similar ones in normal algebra in terms of multiplication and addition. Because in normal algebra, you can say x times one is x. Yes, because x, because one is the identity of multiplication. And then you can also say x plus zero is also x in normal algebra because zero is the identity of addition in normal algebra. So you, so these are similar you know, types of rules, but they are not exactly the same. Um, the other two, actually, you have similar forms also in normal algebra. Um, if you look at you know the um, the or as a plus, then and you look at negation here as arithmetic negation, then whatever value plus the arithmetic negation is going to be a zero, not a one. Okay, but there are sim similar rules about the uh, inversion of a particular value in normal algebra. All right, so let's see what this is taking us. So at this point, I look at this, okay, and I distribute it. So I distribute it by saying phi or psi, excuse me, phi and psi or not psi is the same thing as phi and not psi, the whole thing, or phi and psi, the entire thing. This is distribution, and also I you know, kind of throw in comm commute commutative raw, you know, at the same time, okay? So let's go back and take a look at how distribution works in Boolean algebra. So we have the normal uh, distribution, but we also have the other distribution, which also works in uh, Boolean algebra. Distribution, there we go. Okay, so let's see how that works. If you have a P and, and then you have Q or R like this, then it becomes P and Q or P and R. So this is the first rule of uh, distribution. So if you look at and like multiplication and you look at or like addition, then we got the same thing in normal algebra. 
But in Boolean algebra, the other way of distributing works as well, which means when you have P or, and then Q and R is, are in parentheses, then this also works. This becomes a P or Q and uh, P or R. That works also in Boolean algebra. Okay, so if this does not, does, if this does not look intuitive to you, what are you going to do? You can just try to memorize it, okay? That's one thing. But you know, memorizing is not something that is easily done you know, by staring at something and just wish that you can remember that, okay? It, it might work for some people. It has never worked for me. So in order for me to remember something like this, I will work out the truth table. Because once again, it's serving two purposes at once. One, I get to practice the technique, and this time there will be eight rows to the truth table because P, Q, and R are all independent variables. So we have eight rows. And then on each row, we're gonna have P, the value of P, Q, R, but we also have the value of each expression. And then we can, if we can establish the equality between the expressions on every single row, then we have the proof of the equivalency. Is that okay? All right. I'm going to show you guys a, a technique for those of you who really do not want to do everything by hand and you want to do something you know, with a certain amount of automation in it. So if you're one of those people, you can go to Google Drive, okay? I don't know whether this will work in Excel or not, but I know for sure it does work in Google Drive. So you go to whatever folder you want to use. I'm putting this in the share folder so you can actually see it. Um, I will create a spreadsheet on the fly. You can actually see it now if you have a laptop or on a cell phone. And I'm going to name it using today's date. Today is the last day, oh, second to the last day of February. <clears throat> All right. So you can now say, you know, okay, we got the three variables. We got P, Q, and R. And you can type in all those values yourself. Okay, you can say false, false, oh, false, false, and then false, false, true, false, true, false, false, true, true, and so on. Okay, that's a lot of work. I don't like this kind of a lot of work. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I will have a systematic way of generating the eight rows in this case. So I'm going to say P, this is also base conversion. If you took my CISP 310, you should remember how to do this you know, base conversion. I look at each row as a number offset by a two. Okay, so row two is actually quote unquote zero, row three is actually one, row four is actually two, and so on. And then what I'm going to do is to convert that number into a three bit binary number. Okay, how many people have not been exposed to the conversion? to binary representation. All right, so this should be a very easy and quick discussion then. <laughs> so the way we do this is there will be a mod operation with two because we are doing conversion. And the thing we are modding is going to be the floor of a certain division. Um, and we start with the value that we are dividing, which is the row number minus two. And we want to divide that by 2 to the power of the position that we are dealing with. So that would be power, and it is raising 2, oops, 2 to the power of the position. The position, once again, is going to be, uh, it has to do with the column number. So this time it is the column number minus 1. So column A is corresponding to digit 0, which is the least significant digit. Column B is digit 1, and then column C is digit 2, which is, which is, in this case, the most significant digit. You can always kind of flip it around, okay? But I don't like to flip it around because this makes it kind of flexible. I can have as many columns as I want in this particular case. So that becomes a 0, okay? And if you don't like, you know, looking at 0 and whatnot, you can always, you know, just compare this entire thing. 
uh, and say it is uh, it equals to zero or not. I'm not sure I can put a comparison here. So let me see. Okay, I can. Okay, but then I have to negate it. So we have to say one. So this is the magic thing. Okay, the magical thing is this formula works on every single cell. So if I just need three independent variables, I can now just do that. And I will need eight rows in this case. So I'm going to need all the way down to, okay, one too many. Never mind. Take it back. There we go. So did I just spend more time than it would otherwise take me to type this entire table? Maybe so, okay? But what else? But what is the value of this exercise? If you were me, okay, would you have done it in the way of just typing out every single value? Or would you have spent the time to figure out how to do this using formulae? Hmm? You would use the formulae. And why? Why would you spend more time? Because I, I guarantee you, if, if this is the first time you're doing it, it would take you some time to figure it out. But why would you spend the extra time to figure it out when all you really want are your 24 trues and false? Exactly. So from a pragmatic perspective, this allows you to deal with four variables, five variables, six variables, if that is the situation. That's from the pragmatic perspective. But from the more fundamental perspective, by figuring out how to do this, you are reinforcing your understanding of many other concepts that you should have learned as a computer science major at a two-year you know, community college. You're, re, you're basically reusing the techniques. You're, re, you're reasoning, you're exercising your mind. Why would that be useful? <laughs> really? Yep. By, by doing this, you're able to apply it to more situations that you might be faced with. Mm -hmm. so like, I mean, yeah, like dealing with that equation. You might not translate to something like else, but it gives you like a process of like, okay, how would I go about this? Yep. And then like you can translate that to a different problem that might be similar and might be wrong. Exactly. So very few people, I'm not saying there's none, okay, but very people, very few people are born capable problem solvers. Problem solving is a learned skill, okay? And just like anything else, it is something that you learn by practicing. So the more you practice, you basically look at this and like a puzzle. It's like, okay, I want to learn how to do this. And the more you practice, the more you experiment, oh, okay, this doesn't work, and that doesn't work, okay? And then eventually you find out why it works. So that is how you practice and you train your mind to problem solve. So as you make mistakes, okay, do you think I came up with this you know, the first time and it worked the first time? No. You know, I came up with something, I look at it and go like, no, that's not correct, okay? Am I wasting my time by doing this? Am I wasting my time, you know, just experimenting with something and then figuring out, okay, that's not the answer. Instead of just, uh, I'm just going to look it up, okay? I'm pretty sure if you look up in Google and say, you know, uh, how to come up with a truth table using your know, Excel or your know, spreadsheet formula, you will find it, okay? But it's not the same thing as when you try to figure it out yourself and making mistakes. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. They are not wasting your time. Because with every mistake you make, what are you gaining? Knowledge, exactly, okay? You're, 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 you're refining your understanding of concepts. Every single time you think, I think this should work, except it does not then you have to ask, why is it not working? What is my mis misunderstanding of this concept that led me to believe that this would have worked, but it, except it does not, okay? The only time mistakes are not helpful is when someone makes the same mistakes like 20 times without learning anything. That would not be very productive. 
But if you learn from every single mistake that you have ever made in your life, you'll be a super wise person by now. <laughs> you'll be like Wu Gui in uh, Kung Fu Panda. Yep. Now, getting back to that movie, I think the wisest person in that entire movie is Mr. Peng. He just doesn't look like one. <laughs> Let's go sell some noodles, Paul. I like that. Okay. So now what do we do with the other columns? Okay. You give it the expressions that you want to evaluate. Okay. So in this case, you know, we have you know, P and um, Q or R. Okay. So I'm using the shorthand now. Uh, what looks like multiplication is conjunction. What looks like um, addition is actually a disjunction. Okay. So th this is typically what I do in most of my classes. So now you can actually use the equations, okay? Because in most spreadsheets, it actually can process Boolean expressions, except it looks ugly. So in this case, we have overall and and. Um, P is column A. And then on the other side of the and is an or. And the or is going to have Q as one of the components, R as the other component. Close everything. So that's basically you know P and in parentheses Q or R. And the best thing about, whoops, uh, what did I do? There we go. So the best thing about the spreadsheet is you can copy and paste a cell just like that, okay? So on the other side, I have you know, what I think should be the same, okay? Which is, in this case, you know, P and Q or P and R. So once again, I'm using the shorthand. You know, what looks like multiplication is conjunction. What looks like addition is disjunction. So once again, you know, I'm going to use the uh, spreadsheet thing. Um, typically, if I know that there's something long, you know, between the parentheses, I would open and immediately close the parentheses and then put the cursor back in the middle because this way I won't forget to close the open paren. Okay, um, doesn't mean that you have to do it the same way. I just found that this is really helpful when I'm making long expressions. All right, so what do we do now? We have two and inside. With the first and, it is now between the P and the Q. And then with the second and, it is between the P and the R, like so. Done. And then we do it like this, okay? All right, this is a pretty simple truth table with only eight items. So you can visually and just eyeball the whole thing, go like, yep, yep, okay, they all match. But I cannot trust myself, okay, with just eyeballing. So I'm gonna make another column to see whether they are really the same or not. So we'll just say same. <clears throat> so now we just have to evaluate whether this is the same as that or not, and then make that like this. And if I don't like to read true, false, and just spot all the false, because you know, they're all words, and you know, if you have like 62 rows like this, it's pretty hard to spot the one that is false, right? So what you can also do now is to use conditional uh, formatting. And let me see if I can remember how to do that. Conditional formatting, there we go. <clears throat> Format cell if, and we'll say, not is equal to false. There we go. Um, I think it's working, okay? Um, because it, well, these are all true, so that's why nothing is highlighted. But if I make a mistake somewhere, then all the falses will be highlighted. So I can say, oh, okay, that's not the same. Is that okay? So, I spent a lot of time, okay? I understand. I just spent a lot of time to show something that in many other classes would not be shown. They just tell you, the, the professor would just say, yep, this is an axiom, okay? This equals to that. So what is the value of doing all this stuff here that is not even necessary? Assume like an axiom, therefore it's automatically true. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it kind of helps to know why that works. Mm -hmm. 
that's again, the more you understand something, the more you probably be able to apply that understanding to something else. Exactly. And also, you know, the moment you have to express an expression using the Excel format or you know the spreadsheet format like this, you are exercising that path again. Okay, I'm representing um, P and in parentheses Q or R. This is how we represent it in a spreadsheet. Okay, it's just a formatting thing. But by have to, having to think about how to format it in the form that a formula in the spreadsheet will take you are re-exercising that concept, okay? So now you're building a lot of pathways in your brain. Instead of one single thing, which is this equals that, now your brain has all of these other paths. It is now a mesh connecting the concepts. And the more connections, interconnections you have between the concepts, the more likely you can, one, recall, and two, apply those concepts, okay? but I am not a psychologist, so I really cannot be saying this, but that's my experience. I can say from experience that is the case. All right, so getting back all the way back to what we were doing before, which is this stuff here. So this is distribution, and it turned into these two expressions. This is also distribution turning into these two expressions. All right, so when you're studying, when I'm studying, I have lots of detours, just like what I'm doing in my lectures, lots of detours. I need a structured bulleted list in order to keep track of where I am in a detour and how to get back to the starting point of the detour. But the detours are important because this class is not a standalone class where you go like, okay, after this semester, I will never need to know this stuff ever again. All this stuff is going to be applicable in many of your other classes, you know, as upper division classes in a four-year university. So that means the detours is really helping you to establish more pathways between the concepts. So later on, it is gonna pay off. Well, unless someone decides to change the major to something else, then it's not gonna pay off. So let's hope that is not the case. That would not be, that would not be productive, okay. So between these two, what just happened here? So let me walk up here. Between these two rows, okay, or between these two lines, what just happened? Just syntactically, what happened? Yep. Basically using the identity of um, that negation operator. Um, Not this. yet. Not yet? Not yet. So between the, the, these two lines, um, it's the reverse of distribution. There's a name for the reverse of distribution. What is it? Start factoring. That's right. Okay. So what I did is was factoring because I saw that we have a <clears throat> not phi and not psi, and then we also have a phi and not psi over here. So look, look, focus on these two components. They both have not psi on one side of the conjunction, but the, the other side on one, on one side, on, in one, the other side is a not phi, and then in the other one, the other side is phi itself. I don't even care whether you know, they are negations of each other. The only thing I'm looking for is they are both and not psi as well as and not psi. So now I can use factoring. So that's the reverse of distribution is factoring. So I take this guy, I take this guy and turn it into something that looks simpler. I then take this guy and the other one is the not row sign and one is here and the other one is here. So I have to combine it. The, the application of the commutative rule, which is you're kind of flipping the left-hand side and the right-hand side. But by combining this one with this one, I can now use factoring to say that it is psi and rho or not rho. Is that okay? Now, this is a lot of symbols, right? A lot of parentheses to process, okay? But structurally speaking, that's what I'm doing. I'm, sim I'm, I'm, I'm going backwards now, I'm simplifying. And then from here to here, then we have we established the identity, like you said earlier. 
because now we recognize that the negation of phi or phi is true. We recognize that rho or not rho is also just true. Okay. Yep. Because it is the reverse application of uh, distribution. <clears throat> so you are talking about why these two combine to this. Yeah, like why, why is it phi versus negation of phi or phi? All the other ones are partial. Okay, so let me see if uh, switching to the tablet is going to help. Not that one. Where's my tablet? Ah. Oh, I know where it is. I stashed it on a different tab. There we go. Okay. So we are basically looking on, uh, we're looking for things like this, okay? And turn it into something like this. So it's basically the reverse of what we did earlier. Basically, we break something up and then we recombine the components in a slightly different way so that we, we get an outcome that is useful later on. Is that okay? All right. So it is the application, you know, I have only used the first uh, uh, distributed rule, by the way, okay? The second one has not been used in this particular proof at all. So the factoring is basically just looking at this thing and looking at this thing here and say they're both and not phi, okay? So that part is common. What is not common between the two is one has a not phi and the other one has a regular phi on the other side of the conjunction. And these two big expressions are connected by an or. So that's why we have an or here with the parts that are different. So it's the reverse application of what we did earlier. All right, so simplification, you know, one and whatever is that whatever, whatever and one is that whatever, right? But at this point, I can now say, oh, we can do another simplification here because we have not psi or psi, which by itself, like this, is true already. So we end up with true or blah, blah, blah. True or blah, blah, blah is just true. In other words, you know, if I were to go back to the tablet, I can now say another rule, okay, which is also related to identity, but I don't know the actual name, <clears throat> which is one true or whatever is just true, false and whatever is just false. Now, does it make sense to you, you know, with these two, intuitively? Some people can look at something like this and say, yep, it makes total sense to me intuitively because in order for a or to be true, at least one side has to be true. So if you have a constant true on one side of the or, then the or has to be true anyway. So if that works for you, great. If it doesn't work for you, then you can also use a truth table again to show that regardless of what the value of P is, one or P is going to be one, and also the same for the other one, okay? So you can look at this from the intuitive perspective. You can also look at this from a mechanical perspective, depending on which one you feel more comfortable with. All right, so, but what does it mean? What does it mean when this implication blah, 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 okay, is one? It means, very interestingly, regardless of what phi, psi, or rho are, this implication is always true. Okay, if the implication is always true, then, then what, right? Well, the implication is true if we know the left-hand side is true and the implication itself is also true, then we know the right-hand side has to be true. Let me say that one more time, okay? If these two things individually are true, then the conjunction is going to be true. We know that the, this implication is true so that means this side on the right-hand side of the implication also has to be true. Are we good so far? Okay. And somebody, I'm kind of surprised that nobody has raised their hand and go like, Tech, you just wasted 45 minutes 
because we could have just proven this implication is always true using a truth table. That is actually entirely true. <laughs> okay, so instead of using Boolean algebra to derive you know, the truth, I could have used a truth table and just mechanically and exhaustively prove that regardless of the values of phi, psi, and rho, that implication is always true. I could have done it that way as well. But then I would not have a chance to talk about Boolean algebra, okay, all the rules that I have introduced. Are we kind of doing okay so far at this point? Okay. So if this implication is always true, then we can look at this and go like, hmm, can we turn this into one of those you know, elements in the set zeta? So let me just quiz you guys right now. What are the elements in the set zeta? What is the purpose of those elements? Yes. So they're, they're transformations you can perform on well-formed formulae. Oh. So given that you can match the formats of well-formed formulae that are known to be true already, you can now label some other ones to also to be true. Oh. But I think you know what you're, yeah. I, I know what you meant. You know, I just wanted to make it more spelled out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So that means we can make a new transformation rule. Okay. So what transformation rule are we looking at? We can now say, let's make a new rule. If we know that you know, psi uh, or phi is in the, um, it's one, this matches the format of one of the well-formed formulae that is labeled true, okay? And we have to find another one that is not phi, or rho, okay, then we can say this infers the following. It infers psi or rho, okay? So you look at this and go like, okay, that looks like just a syntactical change, okay? Instead of a conjunction here, we turn it into a comma, and then instead of an implication here, we turn it into an in inference you know, symbol, and then we just introduce you know, some additional braces over here. Yeah, sort of, okay? Because what we're doing is we are taking a equivalency or an implication that is always true in actual Boolean algebra and turn it into a syntactic operation. I'm basically looking at this and go like, okay, go find me a disjunction, okay? Any disjunction. And I'm breaking the disjunction onto two sides. You know, one side is psi, one side is phi. And then find me another disjunction where <clears throat> one part of the, of the disjunction is the negation of phi. So phi by this time is already a particular thing, okay? Um, but the other side of the disjunction can be anything, whatever it is, okay? It doesn't matter, okay? But if you can find me two well-formed formulae, like what we're describing here, aha, then we can label this guy as true. That's what this inference rule is trying to do. Is that okay? All right. So what is special about this inference rule? We start with three things. We end up with only two. Is that okay? All right. So we start off with three Greek letters, also known as schemata in you know, propositional calculus. We start off with three, but we only end up with two. Phi does not appear as the out output, okay? So this is helpful because you know, by repeatedly applying this, we can now you know, reduce the number of variables until there's nothing left, hopefully, okay? All right, so this is resolution. So resolution ultimately depends on things being expressed uh, like disjunctions that are ended together. Let me go back to the slide here. Disjunctions that are ended together. So that means, hey, if I can turn everything, okay, if I turn every Boolean expression into a conjunction of disjunctions, then I can just apply resolution all day long. 
I don't have to rely on the other rules. I don't have to learn about the identity or um, uh, the distribution, uh, the Morgan's law, and so on and so forth. Okay. So the question is, can we do that? Can we turn every Boolean expression into a conjunction of disjunctions? And the only things you can have in the disjunction is either a variable or the negation of a variable. That's pretty restrictive, okay? So let's take a look at some examples first, and then we'll talk about you know, the conversion process. So I got one pretty long uh, example down here. There we go. So this is an expression um, with a solution, but I don't want to show you guys the solution just yet. Okay, because that's actually a long solution. Okay, it's a scenic route solution, which doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just you know, longer than it has to be. So we'll work on this, you know, by ourselves in this class. I'm not going to read the answer to you. Okay, this is a regular, typical, you know, Boolean expression. We have the negation of p, or the negation of r implies q and p or t. Okay, so it's just a you know, regular, typical Boolean expression. And my claim is I can turn this into a disjunct, a conjunction of disjunctions, where in each disjunction I can only mention variables or the negation of variables, nothing else. Okay, so let's figure out how to do that. All right, so I'm going to write this down on my tablet, and then we'll do this step by step on the tablet. <clears throat> so I'm writing this not p or not r implies q and t. And just say to the end well. Okay, there we go. And my tablet. All right. Okay, it did not lose connection. It just had a little hiccup. There we go. All right. So are we doing okay so far with the change of notation? Exclamation point is the negation. What looks like multiplication is conjunction. What looks like addition is disjunction. Okay, all right. All right, so there are many ways to proceed. The usual way that I proceed with is dealing with the implications first. So I'm going to turn the implication into a or. I'm quite certain of this. We have already talked about A implies B is not A or B. Okay. So in other words, if that is new to you, that means hmm, you need to kind of look into how you study for this class, how you're spending your time studying for this class. Or in a certain case of in the case of certain people, whether you're spending time studying for this class. Okay. So this turns into not R or Q. I'm gonna keep everything the same as the other one. All right. So now we have the negation of a disjunction. The negation is right here, and it is negating the result of a disjunction which means what rule can I apply here? We talked about that early in class. When you have a negation of a conjunction or when you have a negation of a disjunction, you can apply De Morgan's Law. Very good. Okay, so we can now apply De Morgan's Law. And as a result of applying De Morgan's Law, then we have um, not R and not Q. And then we still have P or T over here. And the parentheses are, you know, kind of match in that particular way. All right. So what should I do now? Because, you know, what I eventually want to do is to end up with a bunch of disjunctions that are ended together. So when you look at the inside of this entire thing, okay, when I refer to the inside of the entire thing, I'm referring from here to here over here. Yes. So going back to one of the first lines of red line, uh -huh. would you not distribute the negation for not R or Q to then be R and not Q? 
it would be oh you're right I, I forgot one more negation you are correct because it's the negation of a negation here thank you yeah. <laughs> all right so does everybody catch what he said okay i made a mistake of you know not um adding the additional negation to what is already negated which is the not r okay all right so which can then simplify to just a regular r yeah go ahead oh, okay yeah so you can simplify this so that you know not r is just an r so i would put it on the third line and do that simplification so this becomes just you know r or not q and p or t oh okay i just miss copied the entire thing normally when i do this i do it on a when i'm typing it so i can copy and paste but this time i'm not copying and pasting there we go ah, too many okay so this becomes r and not q and then the other one stays the same which is p or t the extra parentheses are not really needed because you know, we are using the same priority as uh, C and C++. So the uh, conjunction automatically has higher priority compared to the disjunction. Okay, let me just pause. Does everybody understand what I just said? We good? Okay, all right. So if you're not quite sure what I just said, you can look it up, okay? You know, it has to do with the intrinsic priority of operators in C++, okay? All right, so when we're at this point, we got some options because we can use distribution one way or the other way, okay? Because you know, we have a conjunction here and then on the other side, we have a disjunction. So we can apply <clears throat> uh, distribution in, we can, we can apply either this distribution. So if I go back to the previous slide, and my tablet is not very responsive right now. Don't know why. Come on. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, so we can actually apply either one of these distribution here so the question is which one looks closer to what we want the first one or the second one what do we want what is a conjunctive normal form so it's either a disjunction of conjunctions or a conjunction of disjunctions what did you write in your notes or did you write anything in your notes? Come on, you guys can do this. CNF is a conjunction of disjunctions. Very good. So which one is closer to a conjunction of disjunctions? The first one or the second one? The second one, okay, very good. So we, this time, we want to apply the second one, which is we are looking for a conjunction, and then we are distribution the conjunction over a disjunction. Okay, all right? So are we, are we good with this slide? Okay, let me just kind of put a star here so that we know which one we want to use. That is the one we want to apply. So now we are doing a pattern matching, okay? We are, we are basically applying pattern matching and ask, do I see something that looks like this on the next slide so I can turn it into something that looks like this? So it's pattern matching, applying the rule, and then end up with a resulting expression that should mean exactly the same thing, except if the form is different. Okay. So getting back here. So what do we do about this? Okay, so the not P will just let it stay outside of this entire thing. So we are now distributing the or over the conjunction. So what do we end up with? Okay. 
So let's go back to the previous slide. Come on. Sometimes technology does not work when you want it to. There we go. Okay. So the start one is the one that we want. We are looking for P and then an OR and then something with an AND. And we actually do not have that, do we? Because we have the AND with the OR. Okay, so that doesn't work. Wait, we actually do have an OR, okay, on the very outside. <clears throat> See this guy over here? That's what we can use. Yep. So we can now say um, R not Q. That's one term. And then we can now say P not P or P or T. Like that. Are we doing okay so far with this? In other words, what I just did was I look at the not P on the outside as one side of the OR. I look at the entire R and not Q as one component of the conjunction. I look at P or T as the other component of the conjunction. And then I apply distribution. So now we have this. Now that we have this, what can we do about that? So this one is, the first part is not quite done yet. But the second part hmm, is kind of done. Because not P or P is a 1, 1 or T is just 1. So this entire thing is just reduced to a 1. But because this one is inside a conjunction, so that means you know, we can just simplify the entire thing out. Yeah? Because I look at this entire thing as one component of the conjunction. Okay, so let let's let me let me copy the rule over here. So the rule is A or B and C is the same thing as A or B and A or C, right? Yeah. So what we have identified is the A is our not P, the B is our R and not Q, and then the C is our P or T. Uh, okay. Okay. This is taking too much time. I'm just going to do it like this. So P or T is our C. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then after we do the expansion, then we have P or R and not Q because you know, we have A or B on this side, and then on the other side, we have A or C. But this entire thing is just C, so then we have not P or the, the whole thing of P or T. Sorry, I'm getting it now. That addition sign was, I thought it was P and Oh, okay. Okay, that's just me having pen, bad penmanship. <clears throat> okay, so now the question is, what do we do with this? So now we have not P or, and then we have R and not Q. So now you do the pattern match again. You go like, but tag, we got the same stuff again because we have something or a conjunction, something or a conjunction. So we can now reapply the same distribution. So this becomes not P or, oops, not P or R and not P or not Q. That becomes, that is the final answer. It is a conjunctive normal form because the entire thing is a conjunction of disjunctions. And inside each disjunction, each term of a disjunction is either a, the negation of a variable or a variable itself. The bigger question is, are we really sure that we did not make any mistake in this entire derivation? Because I'm pretty infamous for making mistakes like that. Okay, you know, when steps are tedious, I tend to make mistakes. The question is, can you check whether, there, whether I made a mistake or not? How about, okay, we still got some time. 
how about we reuse that spreadsheet that we got earlier and just kind of like, hey, maybe we can mechanically do this, to do this, right? So let's go ahead and do it. I, I hope I made a mistake somewhere so that you know, the spreadsheet would actually catch it. And then I can show you guys, oh, look at this. This spreadsheet is really useful. <clears throat> but I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I made a mistake or not. So we can say duplicate. <laughs> yeah, kind of neat, right? And we just get rid of these two. And then one is going to be the original expression. Okay, so let me see what was the the original expression is this, okay, which is a little bit long to express. I am going to move this tab into a new window so I can see it on the side, and then I'll just put it on the uh, on the spreadsheet over here. Okay. So I will express it you know, as an expression first. This is not P or, and since there's no implication in a spreadsheet, oh, wait, okay, this is some, also something that's kind of cool. There's no built-in Boolean formula for, in, for implication in uh, Google Sheets. So the question is, what am I going to do now? Well, I can convert it back into the negation of the left-hand side or the right-hand side. I can do that, okay? It's a mechanical step. But that means one more link where I can make a mistake, which is eh, not good. So instead of doing that, I can do this. This is really cool. So you go to App Script, <clears throat> and we'll do some programming. Hey, this is a CISP class, okay? You know, so we have to do some programming. I just want to find excuses to do it. So we say function implies, okay? And implies take two things, right? We have A, B. Uh, a implies B, okay, ah, you cannot even type. There we go, there we go. So this is going to return the negation of A uh, or B, okay? So we'll we'll use the usual C++, you know, symbols here. And because this is JavaScript, you know, the semicolon is optional. You don't have to have a semicolon that, over there. I typically don't do that, you know, but, you know, just to make it look like regular C, I can just put the semicolon there. So that means it's not that difficult, okay? You can define your own custom functions in Google Sheets, you know, because it takes um, uh, JavaScript as a programming language. And JavaScript as a programming language is C-based, so there are a lot of, you know, common elements you know, between the two programming languages. So for the most part, okay, what you have already learned about C and C++ programming is applicable in JavaScript as well, okay? So control S, save the project, okay? Uh, maybe change the name here a little bit, okay? Logical stuff. Yes, that's very technical right there. <clears throat> and then we got back here. So now we can actually express implication. But before we express that implication, we'll repeat the original equation, just so that I don't miss anything. The negation of R implies Q and P or T. Okay, so that's what I need to express. And this is where infix notation is a problem because in order to type everything using the prefix notation, I have to identify what is the last operation? What is the last overall operation? What, what should be the last operation? Okay, we only got a few operators here. We have negation. We have disjunction, we have implication, and we have conjunction. Which one is the very, very last operation of the entire expression? The or, very good, it's a disjunction. Okay, so this is the disjunction of the not of something, which is just the P by itself, and then the other side is a conjunction of something, and inside the conjunction of something, it is the negation of something uh, versus the con disjunction of something. And then inside the negation is the implication of something implies. <clears throat> and the implication involves R. Okay, so now I can backfill you know, all the parentheses of what is supposed to be inside the parentheses. So this is the left-hand side of the OR, which is the negation of P, which is this particular cell. The implication requires two items. Ah, okay. 
because it's already in the mode of you know, letting me click on something and identify that particular cell. So we have R implies Q. So this is our R. And then the other side is our Q, which is this particular cell. And then the OR also has two components, which is our P and our T. Now we don't have a T. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. But that's okay. We can uh, insert a column to the left. There we go. Now we have T. <laughs> so we have P, Q, R. We don't have S, okay, so we can just go with T, but that means we now have how many rows in this truth table? We have four independent variables. How many rows am I going to have? 16, very good. 2 to the power of 4 is 16. I think this will help convince people and go like, yeah, that was a, not a bad idea to, to kind of come up with the more general way of doing this. Because now I can just do this, and then... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Done. Okay, you guys do not seem excited, but I'm glad I don't have to type a bunch of stuff. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So getting back here, <laughs> we can now, you know, complete our thing here because, you know, we have to or the A2, which is our P, with the T, which is D2. There we go. <clears throat> And it's still loading. Okay, it's it's making use of the function that we just wrote. And did I save it? I thought I did. Come on. All right. Well, if it doesn't like this, I'm gonna copy it. Get rid of the whole thing and then paste it back in just to reset the Google Sheets to force it to reload everything. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> all right, so we'll just extend this all the way down here. And then on this side, we have the simplified version. So um, just getting back to the thing here. So the simplified version or the uh, CNF is uh, this thing here. So I will repeat it on the, uh, the first row of the column too, just so that we know what we are comparing to. So we have the negation of P or R and not P, not Q, okay? T is gone completely. All right, so we'll code this. This is overall an and. And inside the end, we have two ors. And inside the first or, there's a not and then something else. And the negation is the p, which is this one. And then the other one is the r. And then this or has two negations. And then the first negation is p again. The second one is q, which is this one over here. All right, okay. So now we can, I can actually do this, you know, both of them at the same time. And then just kind of extend it down like that. Woohoo! We got it. Because we don't see anything highlighted in column G, which means column E and F are exactly the same. Okay. So I think this is pretty cool. Okay, I think it's pretty cool because. Um, it is it's automating certain things that I know I am prone to make mistakes, okay? <laughs> At least it will catch it, okay? You know, now, would it fix my problem? It's like tech, I think you forgot the negation over here. No, it's not going to fix it. But at least I can tell, okay, it's not working. Why is it not working, right? So to make this tool truly, truly helpful is a parser. In other words, <clears throat> it would be cool to have something that can turn an expression like this into the spreadsheet equation like that. So how many people know how to write a parser like that? 
You guys have not been exposed to do that? Go ahead. Right. Yep. I'm going to ask chat GPT. I, know I have written that parser already, but I want to see whether chat GPT can do it. So I'm going to say uh, write a parser and see where <clears throat> to um, convert Boolean expressions into Google sheet sheets formula that can handle conjunctions disjunctions and we're not going to throw in implication we just have negation here <laughs> all right <laughs> So it's building a tree, okay? So instead of giving me a parser, it's giving me a tree builder that converts you know, a string into a tree of nodes. And then by traversing the nodes in a particular way, then you can basically output you know, the formula or formulae that um, Google Sheets is expecting. Okay, so it gives you half a solution. So let me take a look at the half solution and see whether it works or not. Does it do any string comparison in the process? Okay. All right, so main is just that. And it takes your variables into consideration. And what is this junction? Okay, so it's not, it's doing the opposite, I think. It's building a tree, but it does not parse the an existing expression. So not sure. Okay, let's see what comment it gave you know, before it crank out the code. Okay, creating a complete parser for Boolean expression to Google Sheet formulae in C can be a complex task. However, I can provide you with a simplified example to get you started. This example assumes that your Boolean expression consists of variables, conjunctions, disjunctions, and negations. The output will be in a Google Sheets formula using Google Sheets functions and not or not, et cetera. And it also has, this is a basic example. You may need to extend it into handle to handle more complex Boolean expression, blah, 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 blah. So this is the exact opposite of what I ask it to do. It's saying that if you give me a tree after parsing, I can crank out the Google Sheets formula. But the tree is, has to be constructed by something else. So it doesn't give me the parser. It gave me the opposite of a parser, which is given the tree, given the structure, I can give you the actual text corresponding to that tree. All right. Kind of cool, but it gave you something. <laughs> All right, so it is the end of today's lecture. Uh, we are going to meet next Monday. So I will, um, hopefully you have time to read through the entire thing and go through the example, okay, you know, to, of how we converted from a Boolean expression into CNF, okay? You know, what technique does it entail? When did I use which particular rule and how does it work? Um, homework assignment is due on next Monday, so make sure that you turn in your homework assignment as well for relations. You got a question? Nope? Okay. All right. Have a nice weekend. I'll see you all on Monday. Yes? Oh, okay. So how, how did you prompt it? Okay, just that? Yeah. Nope, not the kind of resolution that we want. <laughs>
Yeah. Okay. We can we can say you know, give me a okay give me a good example of resolution in Boolean algebra. There we go. Certainly. Yep. Yep. That's basically what it is. Okay. Now let's see whether they can prove it or not. <laughs> prove that Boolean resolution works. Oh, <laughs> uh, not too bad, actually. It doesn't actually do, do the proof itself. It gives you an outline. Yep. Yep. Could you show the um, uh, binary thing again with the, um, uh, like the C, Q, R, and the Yeah, it's actually... Oh, it's already in uh, the shared folder. You can oh, actually get to it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Perfect. Sweet. I'll check that out right Yep. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. I do want to learn more about it, so. Google Sheets. You're in my 310 class. You you get to know how it is abused. To I, I, I basically abused uh, Google Sheets and turned it into